Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Eliana Aaron. It is April 20th, and I'm here to give you uh, updates, but today we're going to talk about testing. We're going to talk about some of the contradictions and problems with some of the theories that are floating around about the flattening of the curve. And we're going to start talking about the second wave. And I did talk about the second wave in the past, but I think it's really important that we start talking about it again. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to run through the numbers pretty quickly today. And here we go. So the cumulative uh, cases for today went up by a couple hundred, 222. So again, uh, we're doing very well in that account. Uh, slight increase in the critical cases. Again, there is no such thing as that beautiful bell curve. I'm gonna show you that bell curve and you're gonna see that in fact, um, uh, that's just a model, but it's, never like that and it's never smooth. So assuming that this doesn't start to pop up, which I don't expect, um, this is not significant. Um, and remember, uh, we started our social changes and our loosening of our restrictions in Israel um, only yesterday. Um, that's not going to be reflected here. People don't get critical in a day. So this, is, this has nothing to do with that. Um, so overall, again, epidemiology curve is um, in the same pattern. The, the going up is always sharper than the going down. Again, that beautiful bell curve that we're seeing in all those models is not what really happens in epidemiology in most cases. So this is actually uh, quite normal. And what we're seeing here is we have about 30% um, case resolution um, in terms of uh, recovery. Uh, so that's always a good thing. We like to see that. That's going to continue. And let's remember that if we go back a week ago, we were at a much smaller percentage. We were at 1,800 uh, recovered, and now we're at over 4,000. So we've more than doubled in a week, and that's going to continue rapidly. Our new patients, again, nice and low. We're a little over 1%. We want to stay nice and low like that. Um, and our test rate is something I want to talk about because Israel keeps, you know, kept saying for the last month that we're going to get up to 10,000 a day, 10,000 a day, and their goal is to do 20 to 30,000 tests a day. That hasn't happened yet, but currently our test rate per population is actually higher than all the countries with more or similar cases to us in the world, with the exception of China, because China I had to leave out of the chart because they are not um, being forthright about their testing. And also, let's be real here with everything going on, probably not with any of the information that we have. So China's not in this chart because there isn't any information to report. What we do have here, is showing you that Israel currently has a 2.7% test rate of the entire population. That's the highest test rate of any of the countries with more or uh, similar numbers. Um, and the question is, how does this impact the quick case fatality rate? So, you know, people are asking about testing versus social distancing. And let's remember that Israel didn't get really on board with high-level testing numbers until very recently. So, you know, if we were facing a situation where we didn't have social distancing, we would not be at 1.29% uh, case fatality rate. We would be much higher. So the answer is it's, it's not one or the other. There are some people getting on the news who are telling people that you know, if you test a lot of people, then you can prevent deaths from happening. And I understand why they're saying that, but Israel's um, uh, reduced rate, our case fatality rate being so low, is actually proof that that's not necessarily true, certainly not exclusively. I'm not minimizing the importance of testing. I think testing is going to be re very relevant, and we're going to discuss that. Um, in just a couple of minutes. But I think that the social distancing is the reason why we are uh, among the uh, lowest 
nations. I'm not sure why Israel is here twice, actually. We're going to fix that, but Israel is currently 1.29%. Sorry about that. Um, and Russia is lower, but again, Russia, um, as we know, is not being forthright about everything that's going on. So what does this mean for us? This means that social distancing is absolutely a critical component. We talked about Sweden. Um, you know, Sweden was in the news. I forwarded it to these groups, um, and that was a couple days after I discussed it. But it's important to understand these are opposite policies. They both have impacts. Um, you know, most of these countries are having significant social distancing at this point, whether it was early or too late or too little too late or minimal. Um, but the financial impact of social distancing is significant. Israel's starting to get back into the uh, economy. And uh, I hope that that will continue. And I hope our numbers can stay pretty low as that continues, because sometimes that will actually start causing an uptick in uh, case fatality rates. So I think that's really important. And I, I want to now talk about social distancing real quick. Everyone's seen this. It's from The Economist. Not a great copy, but everyone has seen this chart. I have showed you this chart before. So what we're talking about in terms of lowering the epidemiological curve we talked about this a million times. Everyone's talking about this. We have done it. But there are people getting into the media now who are starting to say that it does not prevent deaths and it causes uh, problems later. So I'm going to just discuss that for a minute and then I'm going to go back to the chart to, um, to discuss um, some of the subtleties of this. It's not so black and white. First of all, one of the things that you're going to see and that you just saw is that these are nice, even curves. And of course, we know that that's not the reality. Uh, everything goes like this, just like the stock market goes like this. That's just the way things are. Um, the other thing is that when you're talking about reducing the, uh, the epidemiological curve, what you're doing is buying time. So the concern that some doctors are posing is that herd immunity is a way to make sure that people have the illness and therefore can't continue spreading it. And herd immunity is absolutely the way we all want to go, but just as in measles, we want to have herd immunity through vaccine because that's a lot safer than having a 14% mortality rate in some of these countries. Um, or even a 1% mortality rate. Remember, like measles mortality rate is much, much lower than that for people uh, when you're in a herd immunity situation, but when you're not, the mortality rate starts to go really high. So um, one of the things that happens when you have a flattened curve is you're buying time. So yes, you have less of the population who is sick, and therefore, as the social distancing laws change, and we start going back into the world and meeting other people, the chances are that this virus, as it seeks new hosts, is going to find lots of new hosts that haven't had the disease. And so we could end up having another bump up on the epidemiological curve. Obviously, that's going to be monitored very carefully. But what does time buy us? Time buys us a few things. Number one, is it buys us the ability to get closer to a vaccine, okay? So we know that there will be a vaccine. Human beings, thank goodness, know how to produce vaccines. It takes time. It needs to be tested. There are quite a few companies around the world, pharmaceutical companies, who are on the path towards a vaccine, and some of them are really like two-thirds of the way there. But even when they have a vaccine, it has to go through many levels of testing before it is deemed to be safe. Okay, we don't just hand out vaccines until we know that we're not going to kill people giving it to them. So by reducing the, epidem the epidemiological curve, what we're actually doing is buying time. So at some point in the process of this uh, disease at a low level, um, we're going to have a vaccine and then we're going to have very sharp downturn and a return to normal because that will give us herd immunity in a safe way. 
if we just say social distancing is bad, and I've heard doctors say social distancing is actually bad because you're just really delaying people getting the disease and then they're going to go back to work and they're going to go back to the mall, they're all going to get it, and it's going to end up being the same numbers. Um, so there's two flaws with that. Number one is social distancing, we know, saves lives. We know it. We see it very clearly. You can see a lot of these countries who either didn't implement change uh, any kind of social distancing laws until very, very late in the game, such as, um, it, well, I, I don't want to blame Italy, but Italy got swarmed. I mean, they, their peak went straight up and they completely lost the ability to manage at their peak um, the cases that were coming in. Remember, the healthcare system is has a certain maximum. And then when you start having cases beyond that, that's why we were hearing about cases in Italy and in other countries where decision, life and death decisions had to be made because there are two ventilators and there are five people. And decisions had to be made of who was gonna get the ventilators. And that's a terrible position for any healthcare provider to be in, any country to be in. So, so not having social distancing, and Italy did implement social distancing, but they did it too late because, again, they kind of peaked before they could even get organized, not blaming them personally. But other countries opted not to until it was late. The UK started off saying, you know what, we're not going to do social distancing, let's do herd immunity. And what ended up happening is they realized this is really, that's not a good approach. And they started implementing herd immunity, I mean, um, excuse me, social distancing, but it was too late. So they're still having a lot of high level cases right now. What we have is, uh, a situation where countries are making those decisions. We discussed that many times. I'm not going to bore you and say it again. But and a very important issue here also is healthcare capacity. Israel, thank God, did not come close to the healthcare capacity. And as this disease started getting to be, you know, of a higher level in Israel, we increased our capacity. So, for example, when we had one case of coronavirus that came from the uh, the cruise off of the coast of Japan back in February, uh, Israel built a coronavirus ward in an external building in Sheba Hospital before we needed it. We didn't even have a case here. We brought her in. She had the ward to herself. And, and Israel continued to um, get more resources, and we didn't come close to needing our 3,000 ventilators. Thank God. Hopefully we never will. Um, so I'm going to go back quickly and I'm going to show you um, that screen again just to explain some of the flaws with this. Number one, the healthcare capacity is somewhere around here, okay, which means that without these measures, the healthcare system can get swarmed. And we saw that in Italy and we see that in other countries and actually in some states, before the federal government started uh, really kicking in, they were also at the point of not being able to handle more cases in some of these ICUs. Um, secondly, what you're not taking into account is that at some point, and we don't know when that's gonna be, I predict probably somewhere between January 2021 and April 2021. I hope it's earlier. I don't think it'll be much later just based on the timing of vaccine development. Uh, again, Hope it's earlier, believe me. Um, what's going to happen when you have a situation like this is somewhere here where I'm indicating there's going to be a vaccine. And then we're going to have a sharp downturn. We're going to have herd immunity. And then everything goes back to normal, like, instantly. Okay? So, obviously, um, that's something that's missing from here. The other thing I want to mention and I'm going to talk about this a lot in the coming days because people are trying to plan what's going to happen and are we going to just go back to normal? And the answer is we're not going to go back to normal until we have that herd immunity from the vaccine. Okay, so there's going to be a new normal. It'll be temporary, but we have to deal with it. Um, most epidemiologists are talking about a second wave. I discussed a second wave. Um, probably a month ago um, on one of these videos. Uh, a second wave 
can mean a few things, and there could be a third wave and a fourth wave, and of course this could continue. A second wave is usually seasonal, but what it means is that there's another uptick when the virus is more active, which is usually in a case of coronavirus types, it's usually in the fall to winter. So what we had here, and the second wave is often much more significant than the first wave, okay? Because remember, again, our first case in Israel is February, I think, 24th or 27th, something like that. I don't remember it by heart, sorry. Don't have everything up here. Um, but that means that our first case was actually um, in towards the end of the winter. Okay, so when we think about a seasonal flu, the seasonal flu now, we're April 20th, is pretty much over, okay? Um, and, and, and those kind of viruses are seasonal, but we know in October that virus will start coming back, in November it will start getting more, in December it'll start peaking. And with coronatype viruses, we often see those waves. And because the second wave is at the beginning of the cold season, there's a longer period of time for cases to keep growing and multiplying. Now, again, with social distancing, we can reduce the epidemiological peak. And in that case, we will actually have a vaccine. I don't think this particular wave that we're, you know, we're, we're ending our wave right now in Israel, I don't think this wave is where we're gonna have a vaccine. I do think that assuming that the epidemiologists, the CDC, assuming that they are correct, when the second wave hits, if it hits, um, the optimism that we have is that that vaccine will be developed and then we're gonna go back to normal. So important to keep that in mind. Uh, I'm going to discuss this more as things progress here in Israel and I hope everyone stays safe, stays well, stays healthy and stays home. Take care.